Now, this morning, as I said last Sunday, not to miss because chapter 2 is quite interesting. So let's begin to walk through uh, chapter 2, uh, verse 1. Jonah chapter 2, verse 1. Let's see what God is going to say to us this morning. Let's read aloud and strong together. Keep your eyes on me, camera guy. Let's read together loud and strong. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. Let's read it one more time. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. How can you be in disobedience to God, but you are still a child of God? That is quite interesting. Where did I find that? In, jo in chapter 2, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord, who? His God. That means he still has a relationship with God. As we all do at times, we can have a relationship with God, but at some point we can drift. Some point we can be in disobedience. Jonah was in complete disobedience to God, but God still considered him his child. He still considers God his father. That's why he can say he's praying to his God. Not anybody else's God, but to his God. Now, let's look at what he, his prayer was. Look at verse 2. And he said, his prayer is being made public being made known. So we, we want to, to hear what his prayer is, and then I'm going to bring some application this morning because as simple as these verses are that we are reading, they are chock full with stuff this morning that will make you walk out of here with your head up, think you can walk on a swimming pool and not sink, okay? Look at verse 2, and let's see what his prayer was. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol, the word Sheol means hell, Hebrew word for hell. Out of the belly of Sheol, I cried, and he heard my voice. Look at verse 3. And you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the floods surrounded me, all your billows and your waves passed over me. Now, let's look at some things here. And let's go back to uh, verse 1. Then Jonah prayed. I want you to look at that first word, then. You can underline it, circle it, highlight it, have a mental note of it, then. Now, if you say something to someone... I am going to Walmart after church, then I'm going out to eat. So it, it, it implies that something is being done before you go to eat. Does it make sense? Yes. So whenever you use the word then, that means something took place before or is coming after something that has taken place. Look at verse two, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 again. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. So that implies something caused him to pray to God where he was located. Now, now it, it's, it's, so, it's so powerful here because then Jonah prayed. What caused him to pray, if you, if you remember last time? Go back to chapter 1 and look at verse, uh, verse uh, 17, verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then something happens. What happened? After they threw him into the sea... Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. That means they got saved. They got converted. Look at verse 17. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. How many days? How many nights? Now, so go to chapter 2. So chapter 1, we established... Something took place because 
you are only going to use then, T-H-E-N, after something has taken place. Are you correct? Am I correct? Okay, whether you agree or not, I, I think I'm on the right bus. Yeah, get closer, uh, Devin. Uh, so I think I'm on the right bus. So, Tamika, what transpired? What caused him to pray? What caused him to cry to God? He was thrown over sea, overboard into the sea, got swallowed by a, a great fish. Now he's in the belly of the fish three days, three nights. I think you're going to pray. I think you're going to pray. I, 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 am, I am so convinced anytime you are in deep hot water, deep trouble, I believe you're going to, you're going to pray. If you don't pray, something is wrong with you. If, if you see trouble all around you, if you are neck deep in trouble, can't pay your bills, eviction notices on your door, a, a repossession notices on your car, uh, uh, you're backed up with all your bills, you just got laid off or fired or terminated, whatever you want to call it, uh, you have trouble at your house, honey, you better pray. Amen. If, if you don't pray, don't want to pray, Something is mentally wrong with you if you call yourself a believer or a child of God, if you call yourself a person that goes to church, a person that reads the Bible, and you are neck deep in trouble, and you're not praying, honey, something, you need a checkup from your neck up. Yes. <laughs> Would you agree? Yes. So, so Shanae, we, we are establishing what caused Jonah to pray. Now, that means, that means he was not praying before he got thrown over sea. How do I know he was not praying? What was he doing? He was fast asleep. <laughs> he was in the bottom of the boat, comfortable. I mean, I mean the guy was just snoring away and drooling away <laughs> on the people's boat, in the people's boat. So, he was not praying he was out of the will of God. Hear me carefully, carefully, hear me carefully. Most times when people are out of the will of God, it takes, I mean, a whole lot for them to begin to pray. Because you know you are in disobedience. You know you are out of the will of God. So you are embarrassed to pray. Because who are you praying to? The one that you are in disobedience to. So you are afraid to face him. So you rather not Say anything. You'd rather stay silent, quiet, because you know you are on the run. So Jonah, let, let's look at it one more time. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. Jonah prayed. Then Jonah prayed. Now, I, I've, I've mentioned this so many times. Around the world, including America, most times when things are going well, People don't really care for church, don't care to ask the Christians, the believers to pray. Now, everybody is summoning in prayer because of what's going on in Israel right now. Everybody is saying, let's pray for Israel. Let's pray for the peace of Israel. Everybody is praying. Now, when 9-11 hit America, when the Twin Towers fell, everybody, those who didn't go to church, went to church. Those who doesn't know, those who don't know how to pray or didn't know how to pray, didn't know how to pray, they prayed. Those who never read the Bible, read the Bible when the Twin Towers fell. When you have Hurricane Katrina, Hurricane uh, Sandy, Hurricane whatever, storms that hit America, wherever there is devastation, destruction, people always rise up to say, let us pray. pray. I am a little confused. Why do you want to pray only when you are in trouble? I think we should pray before, Amen. during, and I think we should pray before, during, and after. Why? It will make you a stronger person to go through the storm. Amen. Yes. I'm about to preach, but I'm not going to dance today. I'm about to preach, but I'm not going to dance because I have a guest. He might not come back. Now, then Jonah prayed. 
I told you sometime when I was a police officer in the Virgin Islands, uh, uh, some of the members came to me, a couple, uh, husband and wife came to me and said, Pastor, we have a dear friend in prison, in the jail. We would like you to go and talk to him. He got arrested for embezzlement and some other you know, illegal stuff. He was a contractor. I, I went to see the man, didn't know the man, uh, that said to him, hey, you have a visitor. He came out and he, he was expecting me and he came out and, uh, and Tamika, he came out like a humble angel, speaking soft. His body language was humble. Why? Because he realized, oh man, I'm about to preach, man. He realized, he realized he is in the hands of the law. And when you're in the hands of the law, you realize you can't run anymore. That's true. Mm -hmm. Am I helping anybody oh, this yeah. morning? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he said to me, Pastor, I am, I, am, I, am, I am happy that I am here. A first man I ever met who said he's happy to be in jail. Everybody else wants to, everybody wants to get out. Everybody is trying to find a way how to break out of, ha out of jail. Mm -hmm. But this guy said to me, Pastor, I am happy I am in jail. And he said, Pastor, right before you came to see me, I was laying on my back on my bed, and I was just talking to God. He was so humble. His yeah. voice was humble. His body language was humble. His facial expression was humble. Why? He realized, you ain't that bad, bro. Yep. Yep. He realized the law has caught up with him. Yeah. Now, look one more time. I'm going to move forward. Then Jonah prayed. When did this contractor pray and became a humble, have this soft-spoken, humble, gentle voice, when you realize the law has me? When do, when do a lot of people decide to become Christians and believers and start reading the Bible and start praying and start looking to God? Only when they got arrested and in prison and in prison serving time, all of a sudden they become believers. I am, I am happy they become believers. But why did it take that extreme to drive you to God? Sometimes God allows certain things to drive us to the point where we realize there is a God above. Amen. And you ain't bad as, as bad as you think you are. That's right. Anybody listening? <laughs> look, look what he says. Then Jonah prayed. Then the man who got arrested prayed. Then the man who is in jail prayed. When he lost his wife, then he prayed. When he lost, when she lost her husband, then she prayed. When, when her children are in jail, then husband and wife prayed. Something always drives us to prayer. When did Jonah pray? When he was thrown overboard. Swallowed by a great fish inside of the fish's belly for three days. That's a long time. That's a very long time. Jonah was arrested and can't, can't do anything about it. All he had to do, he had one thing to do. One thing to do was prayer. Prayer. Listen, sometimes we can be in between a rock and a hard place. And there's nothing else you can do but pray. pray. Nothing else you can do but pray. When, when my mom was in the hospital, and I, I, all my life, my mom gave birth to four children. I'm the eldest. <coughs> and all my life, Tamika, I, I am so accustomed of rescuing my mom, doing things to make her happy and comfortable, running to her rescue, fixing anything that seems to be wrong, out of whack. But I realized that this time, Devin, my hands were tied. And only thing I could have done while my mom was at the hospital was anoint her with oil, prayed, and also called my friends and family to pray for her. I realized nothing else I could do. All I could do was... Because my back was against the wall, Tamika. I was between a rock and a hard place. I, there's this, I, I couldn't find death and fight him back. All I could have done was, Jonah realized his back was against the wall. He realized I am out of options. He realized, man, I was thrown overboard. I was swallowed by a great fish. I am here now in this fish hotel. 
three days, three nights. I can't go anywhere unless God releases me. Unless God releases me. Look what he says. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God. Hear me. The good thing you have when your back is against the wall, when, when you are in deep trouble, when you are in hot water, when you, when you are in hell, not literal hell, but trouble, difficulties beyond your control, the best thing you can do is cry out to God. And that's what Jonah, Jonah was smart enough to know, yes, I am in disobedience. I am running from my assignment. I am running from what God told me to do, refusing to do it. And Jonah realized it caught up with him. And he realized, look where I ended up. Let me stop and say this. And this is for everybody that's here, especially young people, those of you watching. Now, sometimes we find our play ourselves in a difficult spot, a difficult predicament, and many times we utter these words, look where I ended up. Then we like to say, look what it costs me. Why? Disobedience costs. Disobedience? Cost. Disobedience against God is expensive. Yes. Disobedience against the law of the land is expensive and hard. I can tell you, I was a police officer, I know. Disobedience against the law, like I said all the time, any time a police officer pull you over, don't try to flex your muscles. You're not going to win. You're not going to win. <laughs> I mean, any time a police officer pull you over, Devin, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Yes, sir, yes, ma'am. Just comply. If you comply good enough with the right facial expression, most time they'll let you off. But if you give me mouth, you're getting a ticket. You're getting a ticket. I, when I pulled you over, I was intending to give you a warning. But, but you, you, you're flexing your muscles, trying to give me lip service. Now I'm going to give you a ticket because you ain't that bad. <laughs> Anybody listening? Okay? So anytime you get pulled over, you just comply. Yes? Driver license, don't ask why do you want my driver license, just give the man or the woman the driver license. Make it easy. I got pulled over uh, maybe three weeks ago in the night in Ackworth. I've said to you before, anytime you're in small cities, respect the laws of the land. Anytime you're in a small city, don't try to speed, don't run the light. Orange means slow down, get ready to. Orange doesn't mean speed up and try to catch it. <laughs> yes? Yes. So I got pulled over in Ackworth because, you know, Ackworth police, uh, they're bored. It's a small city, so they're looking for things to do. Okay, that's the secret. In a small city, they'll pull you over easily because they are bored. They have nothing to do. So I got pulled over three weeks ago in the night, and the reason why she pulled me over, she said, your right rear brake light is out. That's all she pulled me over for. You know she's bored. <laughs> if you pulled me over just for a break light, it means you are completely bored and have nothing to do. She pulled me over, and uh, she asked me for my driver's license, walked back to the car to check to see if there's any warrant out on me. Now, any, listen again to any time a police pulls you over, don't try to run. Don't try to run. They already pulled. They already run your, ran your tag. They know who you are. If, if that's not your car, they already know who the car belongs to. So if your cousin lent you the car, they know who your cousin is. They know where to find it. Just, just stop. Don't run. You can't, they, they, come on. I, I, let me, I'm educating you. They already ran your tag before they pull you over to know who they are going up against. If this person is a, a strong criminal, they'll call for backup right away because they already ran your tag. They know who you are. They know who they're dealing with. Okay? So it make no sense to run, to stop, comply, follow the, the laws of the land. So I uh, went to the car, checked my driver's license, and she came back. And black lady, the way she approached my car the first, uh, when she f first came for my driver's license, I, I can tell she's a rookie. I can tell she's new on the job, the way she approached my car. It's nighttime. You don't approach, I don't care if the tag comes back clean, this is not a criminal, you don't know. 
She approached my car in a lackadaisical, sluggish, don't care attitude, like, like nothing can happen. Now, people already don't like police officers. Police officer, that job is one of the most riskiest jobs in the world. Every day you have to pray that you go back home alive to your family. Every day you leave your home, you have to pray you're going back alive to your house. So she approached my car, not prepared, just in case it was a criminal who was going to challenge her. So she gave me back my license. She says, oh, your, your brake light is out. I'm just going to give you a verbal warning. I said, yes, ma'am, I'll get it taken care of the next day. And the next day I went and got a bulb, put it in myself, because the next day, in case she stops me, I already gave her my word, Tamika, that I will take care of it the next day, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to be back in Ackworth, get stopped again, Shanae, and the same lady, she said, I thought, you, no, I'm going to get a citation, a ticket. Yeah, yeah. So I made sure I complied and get it fixed. So I now engaged in a conversation. I said, how, how long have you been a police officer? And she said, um, uh, uh, three months, something of that nature. Uh, she, and she said, this is my second night working by myself. I, I said, I can tell that you are a rookie. In a nice, smiling way. I had the, my smiling charm on so she don't get too upset with me, you know. And we had a conversation. I told her I was a police officer in the Virgin Islands, blah, blah, blah. And I said to her, when I was a police officer, I said to her, when I pull over any car, doesn't matter if it's an old, toothless lady, my hand is always on my firearm. I said, any time I, 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 I walk up to a car, my hand is always on my firearm. just in case. I said, you didn't do that. I said, it's, it's a dangerous world out here. You're working by yourself. You're new to this game. You're not experienced. You need to be prepared. And she said, that, that's true. That's true. She, she took my advice. She didn't tell me, well, who do you think? She took my advice because it's a crazy world. All right? So how did I get off to that? How did I get off to that? <laughs> what, what made me say all that? What made me say all that? Did, why did I get off to that? Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. Uh, how did I get off to this, Devin? What made you, uh, Who was following? Huh? You guys are just listening to the story. You can't get me back on track now. Huh? I'm going to stop giving you guys stories. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. The fish's belly. Now, I want you to keep your finger in Jonah. Go to Psalms 130. Psalms 130. Um, remember, this is a teaching church. This is not a whooping, screaming church, so we take our time. We're not here to entertain. We're here to educate and empower. We're here so you can learn the Bible, not, not, not a bunch of screaming and hollering and, and you leave, you don't learn anything, okay? Amen. Psalms 130, let's look at verse 1. Let's, one. let's read it loud and strong. Out of the depths I cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice and let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplication. This man said, out of the depths. Out of the depths, in reference also can be to Jonah. Out of the depths, I cried. Well, you see, sometimes we have to be so deep in some mess for us to cry to God. What, what, what moves us to cry to God? What moves us to call on him? Sometimes we have to be over our head in some stuff that prompts us to say, God, I need your help. Sometimes we got ourselves in some mess ourselves. And sometimes the devil can be messing with us. And other times people can be messing with us. Right. Yes, class? Yeah. Now, so look at this one more time. Go back to Jonah. And I want to show you some more scriptures. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. And he said, what did he say? And he said in verse 2, I cried out to the Lord. What's the word? What's the next word? Because... Of my affliction, and what happened? And, the Lord and, and God still listened to the man. God heard him. Mm -hmm. God didn't say, you disobedient prophet, running from me. I told you to do something. You didn't do it. I'm not, I'm not listening to you. The Bible says, in his disobedience, 
God heard. God heard. Oh man, I like that. In, 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 in our disobedience, God can still hear us. This proves also, Shanae and Tamika, that we can pray to God anytime, anywhere, any place. Where was he praying from? Ah, man. You can be in the shower and you can be praying. You, you don't have to always be down on your knees, as the old people like to say. I had a pastor friend to, to, to make us feel like he's really close to God. He liked to say, I was on my knees crying out to God. I, I, don't, I didn't believe that guy. <laughs> you don't have to always be on your knees. You can be flat on your back, on your bed, praying. I had a pastor friend came to stay with me in the Virgin Islands. We were having a week of services, and he stayed at my house because we went way back, went to college together. He's like a son to my mom, a brother to my siblings, and, and, and he came to my house. And, and, and one day I said, man, I haven't seen you prayed yet. And he was ironing to me. He was ironing his shirt for church. And I said, man, I haven't seen you pray since I've been here. He said, man, you didn't hear me praying right now in tongues right now, man? <laughs> he said, man, I was in the shower. I was praying. I'm ironing my shirt right now. I'm praying. Are you hearing me? He said, you don't have to be real. Uh, listen, I remember we were having church in a hotel, Tamika, and I couldn't wait for us to get our building because I wanted to have early morning prayer, 5 a.m. prayer. And we were going to the building at 5 a.m. When the preacher came to stay with me, he asked me one morning, where are you going? I said, I'm going to early morning prayer. He said, where? He said, at the church. He said, why? He said, we meet with God at 5. He said, so you can't meet with God no other time? <laughs> Man, I shut that prayer down. I shut it down. Why? I was follow suiting what people were doing. That church had early morning prayer. That church had noonday prayer. I was just doing the traditional thing, not knowing why I was doing it. I shut that prayer down. Why? Everybody pray at your house. Amen. Preach. Only preach. preach. He, he, he said, but you can't meet with God. He said, man, you're getting up, driving all the way downtown. to meet. You said God meets you only at that spot? <laughs> here's something else here's something else churches like to do let's all stand for the reading of God's word in his divine presence <laughs> oh man I remember when I was 27 years old in Miami just got married so a lot of my family members were still there from the wedding came to the church that Sunday morning and there we were, I announced the scripture, and a lot of my family members, two of them especially, who were saved, strong believers. And I said, let's I announce the scripture reading. And one of my aunt looked at me like, I didn't say everybody stand. And she looked at me like, we usually stand at our church. And that's my aunt. So I, I'm 27. She's way up in age. I, I don't know what to do now. I said, we, we don't stand here. <laughs> Amen. 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 She like, we stand, and I know she was talking about our church back in Virgin Island. We stand at our church. We ain't, ain't, this ain't your church. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I met somebody. No, I'll explain this to you. You say, well, what are you talking about? Well, when you go home tonight and you're reading God's word, why don't you stand up and read in your house? I know you don't stand in the living room and read. You sit on your sofa and you read. You sit on your bed and you read. You sit on your toilet bowl and you read. Huh? Do you stand over the toilet bowl and you read? No. So why do we, when we come in the public, we always have to be all, all religious and sanctimonious and, and think there's something different about this? You can be at a dining room table and you're sitting down and you're reading the word. So we don't stand and read. You sit and read. I meant somebody. Now, there are times in the Bible that you see people, when they were reading the word, that did stand. But not all the time. Okay? Now, let's go back to what, what I, what, where I was. So then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. And he said, what did Jonah say? I cried out to the Lord because, why, look at the word, because, why was he praying? 
Why was he? Now, you see that word cry? That word cry meaning it's, it's something, a, a deep emotional expression. This is when somebody is in trouble. You cry out to God. Doesn't literally mean tears coming down your cheeks. But it means strong emotional expression of you are in trouble and you need help. Amen. Does it make sense? So anytime you read the Bible and you find this phrase, he cried out to God, she cried out to God, they cried out to God. It means they were in trouble and they were desperate for help. Yes? So what did Jonah pray? I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. affliction. Can I stop and say something here? Now, please don't rush me. We're still on verse one. I know you want to finish chapter two, but we're not. We're going to take our time because there's a lot here. Now. Now, notice what it says in verse 2, Tamika. And he, read, and he, everybody, and he, verse 2, and he, no, look at verse 2, and he, what's the first, third word in verse 2? And he said, so what did Jonah do? He says, right? Now listen to me, class. Listen. You ever been to a church or somewhere and people and, you know, everybody is, they're having prayer requests to make a prayer request. Anybody have any prayer requests? And Devin slips his hand out. I have a prayer request. What's your prayer request? Well, I have an unspoken prayer request. I ain't praying for you, Devin. I have a prayer request. What's it, Devin? It's an unspoken prayer request. There's no such thing as an unspoken prayer request. If you want me to pray for you, tell me what to pray for or about. Yes. Something else we like to say in church. That's when you don't want people to know your business, but you want them to guess your prayer request and say, Lord, whatever Tamika is believing for, God move right down there at that place at 2945 Bridget Reed Street. She's calling on you. I don't know what it is, but you know what it is, God. So right now I'm interceding with Tamika. You know her prayer request. It's a silent prayer request, Lord. Uh, no, it ain't silent. You better, if you're in trouble, you better open your mouth. Amen. Tell me what to pray for. So we like to say, it's a sil- I have a silent prayer request. You are in trouble. And you have the audacity to say, your prayer request is, you are in trouble. <laughs> Do, look at verse 2. Did, did Jonah have a silent prayer request here? No. Did, did Jonah have an unspoken prayer request? Mm-mm. Look what the Bible says. His, his prayer request was made public and made known. How do I know that? Look what it says. And he, and he said, I cried out to the Lord. This is his prayer. What's his prayer? Because of my affliction. And he answered me. So God does answer to prayers that are spoken. So we have to get away from these traditional stuff, unspoken prayer requests, silent prayer requests, uh, because you don't want, listen, I don't, when I'm in trouble, I don't care who knows. When I'm in trouble, I don't care who knows. Why? I need help. You need help, and I need help. He says, he's crying, why? Because of his affliction. Now, let's look at uh, that affliction thing. Affliction. Afflict. Look at, look at, go to Psalms 119. Psalms 119. Affliction. And let's look at, uh, I want to give you that, that, that meaning for the word affliction. Um, Affliction. Because I want you to understand what, what going on here with Jonah Affliction. Affliction means to oppress, afflict, or humble. Sometimes when people are in trouble, they get caught up with the law. They end up in jail or prison 
or something tragic happens, we like to say, that happened to humble them. Back in my island, back in the 80s and 90s, there was a man in the islands. He was the most handsome man in the neighborhood. Everybody knew it. He was the most handsome. Oh, man. God took three days to make that man. That's how handsome he was. And he knew it. He was gifted. He was talented. He was educated. Young. I saw a picture of the same guy on Facebook last week. I had to screenshot it, Tamika. He lost all his hair. He don't look the same anymore. I sent the picture to my cousin. I said, show this to your mom and ask her if she recognized this guy. Because my aunt went to school with the guy. And my aunt knew the guy was the most handsome guy in the world. My aunt didn't even recognize him until I told her who he was. And she said, I said to my daughter, he lost all of his handsomeness. Are you hearing me? I've said to you over and over, time and age will humble us. Yes. <laughs> I told you, I thought I had it going on too. <laughs> Tamika, I thought, I remember when I was pastoring in the Virgin Islands, I used to send the videos back to Atlanta so my mom and my sister could see the videos. One day my mom said, she was looking at one of the videos and my sister was close by. And my mom said to my sister, look at your brother. The older he becomes, he's getting more and more handsome. And my sister froze. <laughs> I don't know if she froze out of jealousy. I don't, I don't know if she froze out of confusion. I, but she froze. And she had an expression on her face at my mom. My mom said, look at your brother. The older he becomes, he, he is getting more and more handsome. That's what my mom said. There's a lady who was coming to this church. I haven't seen in quite some time. And we went to Chili's to eat on East West Connector. And I went to the bathroom, and on my way back from the bathroom, I decided to stop by the ladies' table with the family and decided to greet them and say how they're doing. I, I, I sat next to the lady and, 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 and talking. The lady didn't say, Pastor, good to see you. Pastor, I haven't seen you in a while. She didn't say that. She said, Pastor, she looked at me with a confused look. She said, Pastor, you're getting old. No. <laughs> Are you hearing me, somebody? What's my point? Time and age humble us. Yes. That man in the island thought he was going to be handsome for all his life. He thought he was never, never going to grow old. But time and age may humble us. Afflict means to humble. Afflict means to Humble, it means to oppress, and it means also to afflict. It's an expression, it, it expresses a sense of helplessness and distress. When you hear affliction, it means you are helpless and you are in distress. You are helpless and you are in distress. And Jonah was helpless and distressed. Why? He was in the fish's belly, couldn't go anywhere unless God released him, Right? Now, let's go to Psalms 119, and let's look at uh, verse 71. What Psalms are we going to? 119. 119, and what verse? 71. 71. Psalms 119. I know we're moving slow, but this one is good today, right? Yeah. Psalms 119, and look at verse 71. Let's read it together loud and strong. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. Ah, this is good. The psalmist is saying it was a good thing that he was in trouble. Yeah. He, he, he's saying, I, 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 like the guy who was in jail said, Pastor, I'm glad I was arrested. It slowed me down. It, it made me take an inventory of my life. So the psalmist is saying, look what it says one more time, verse 71. It is good for me that I was humbled, oppressed, afflicted. 
He said, I, I needed that. Oh, man. Can, can you be honest with yourself and say, I needed that. Yes. Some people who have gone to jail or prison, they say, man, I needed this. This had to have happened to me. If not, I would have not slowed down or stopped. I would have died somewhere along the way. Yes. So the psalmist says, it was good for me that I have been what? Afflicted. I needed this. I needed this in my life. I needed this to slow me down. I needed this thing to stop me. I ne if I had this thing never happened to me, I would have been in worse situation. A worse situation. Yeah. He said, I needed this. Look, go back to Jonah. Go back to Jonah. And so he, we, we know what his prayer request was. He said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me. What was his affliction? The man was thrown overboard, swallowed by a great fish, and he was in the fish's belly for three days and three nights. That's enough to afflict you. That's enough to oppress you. That's enough to humble you. If that doesn't humble you, man, something is wrong. There are things in life will come our way designed to humble us. And it... it, it it's for us to learn the lesson and not make the same dumb mistakes again. Is anybody listening to Odie? Yes. He said he cried out to the Lord <coughs> because of my affliction. Go to Isaiah 49, verse 13. Isaiah 49, just go left. Isaiah 49 and verse 13. I want to show you one more. Sing, O heavens. Be joyful, O earth. Break out in singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted, comforted his people and will have mercy on his afflicted. God will have mercy on who? Those who have been afflicted. Even though we, we, we find ourselves in some affliction, being oppressed or humbled, whatever the reason is, he said, God will have mercy on our affliction. What does mercy do? Mercy gives us a second chance, and mercy overlooks our faults. When God applies his mercy to us, he's giving us a second chance, and he's overlooking our faults. Okay? Now, let's, 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 let's wrap this up. But before I wrap it up, I want to show you something here. <clears throat> Go to Exodus chapter 2. Second book of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Exodus chapter 2. Because we're talking about affliction, right? And we're talking about how Jonah cried out to God when he was afflicted, when he was afflicted. Why was he afflicted? Because he was in disobedience. He was in disobedience, uh, disobeying God, refusing to do what God wanted him to do. Let us be in total compliance to God. Amen. Now, and this goes for parents, and parents that are watching at home, listening at home, wherever you are. Now, don't ever apologize for being hard on your children when it comes to discipline to keep them on the right path. Don't. I'll tell you why. Because if you don't discipline them, somewhere along the, the journey of life, they are going to get caught up with the law. Now, hear me carefully. Now, at home, they realize I am getting away with things. Now, I have three young folks live at my house. And I have no, no, I love them all to death. But when it comes to training, discipline, keeping them on the right path, that is my duty. Why? God says, parents, train up the child in the way they should go. Amen. Not the way they want to go or feel like they should go or follow everybody else. He said, train them up in the way that they need to go, they should go. This is the path for them. So I don't apologize sometimes when I come down hard on my, my, my nephews and my niece at the house. Why? I have to do this, Tamika, why? Because if they keep getting away at the house, they will leave the house and go out to test the law of the land. 
and the law of the land does not have as much mercy as your mom and your dad will have on you. The law of the land is merciless. I can, I, listen, I, I can tell you, I was a police officer, I can tell you. The law of the land is merciless. merciless. So you have to keep them on the straight and narrow way. And hear what parents always say constantly, over and over, I have to do this so you don't get in the hands of the law. I have to do this so you don't end up in jail. I have to do this so you don't end up in prison. Because once you're in the system, you're locked. Listen. So, you have to discipline. You have to keep them on the straight and narrow path so they don't end up in the hands of the law so they stay in your hands. Because when they get into the hands of the law, it's not easy to get out. And, and if you are thrown behind bars, if you're in jail or in prison, it, it's, it's no telling if you're going to come out alive. Prison is brutal. Prison is? Brutal. I had to make an arrest one day in Virgin Islands. I, know, uh, I, I, know the young, I knew the young man. The young man knew me. He came to my church, and so he knew I was a police. He knew I was a preacher. And he had uh, domestic violences when you have problems with your... Either your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, or your wife. Domestic violence. It's called domestic violence. And anytime there is domestic violence, somebody has to be arrested. You can't leave the two persons at the same location. Somebody's going to jail. And it was my case. I knew the young man. He knew me. Man, when I got to the scene, the young man, the, the man, the, the strong man, he cried. He said, he said, Pastor, I don't want to go to jail. He cried. He cried. He cried. Listen carefully, please. When I was studying criminal justice to get my associate's degree in criminal justice, I took a course called Corrections that talks about the prison and the jail system. When I took the course, Devon, I made a vow to myself to always comply with the, la the law of the land because police officers can go to jail too. So I made a determination, Shanae, I ain't going to jail. I ain't going to prison. Why? When I read that, when I studied corrections, and I see the things that go on in jail and prison, I said, I ain't going. People get beat up. People get killed. I remember in the Virgin Islands, I, I was called, we were called to just transport a guy to the hospital. They made a makeshift weapon in prison and just brutalized a young man, almost killed him. It ain't a joke. So, here it is, here it is. He said, I cried out because of reason of my affliction, and he answered me. So, parents, don't apologize to your children for being hard or disciplining them. Why? You are trying to keep them out of the hands of the law or the system, because once they get to prison or jail, it's no joke. So, what are you doing? I'm disciplining them now. So they don't go in the wrong way. They don't go in the wrong direction. You don't want them to fall into the wrong hands. Is anybody listening? Yes. Jonah here, he said, I cried out because of my affliction. I, I think I told you the story of um, my, my stepmom has two nephews in the Virgin Islands, two brothers, arguing. One brother shot and killed another brother over a verbal argument. So one is in the grave and one is in prison. So my stepmother two weeks ago said she spoke to the young man who was in prison. She called, he called her. You know, that's his answer. He called her. And, and all of a sudden he changed overnight. He's now regretting what he did. But his regrets won't release him. Feeling sorry won't release him. You see, that's why I said at the house, the children can get away with certain things. We can disobey our parents. They will be lenient to us. They will, they will you know, still be nice to you. But listen, when you bro break the law of the land, they are throwing you in prison. Are you hearing me? At the house, you have leniency. 
But you break the law of the land, they have no leniency. This young man decided to go to Dallas Theological Seminary as a close. And he said, uh, in the summer, I'm going to work to Mika, get some money to pay my way through school, pay my tuition if I'm going to come back to this school. And he decided he's going out to work to raise the money to pay for his tuition. He decided to get a job driving the transit bus. And driving the bus, he's a Christian, nice young man. He's in a rough area of town. Four, five, six, seven young men got on the bus the first day. They got on the bus, didn't pay. Being rowdy, loud, disrespectful to everybody else on the bus, causing trouble on the bus. The next day, same young man got on the bus, didn't pay, cursing out the bus driver. Why? Somewhere along the line, somewhere at the house, they got away with a lot of things. And they feel like I can try when I, I can try the same thing outside with other people. Because I got away with my parents. Got on the bus, next day, same thing. Third day, same guy, same thing. The fourth day, the young man said, enough is enough. I had enough. I'm going to do something about it. Looking ahead, he saw a police officer at the next stop. He pulled up at the bus stop and he beckoned to the police officer to get on the bus. And they say, you see this group of guys back here? This is the fourth day that they, they, they haven't paid. They've been loud, disrespectful, causing trouble on the bus to everybody. He was expecting the police officer to arrest them. The police officer walked off the bus. He said, the next time I, I found myself behind the steering wheel, engine still running, told my front teeth missing, my eyes are black and blue, can hardly see, bleeding all over. Those guys beat him almost to death because he racked. That's what you say? Yeah. yeah. He, he, what's another word? He squealed. Snitch, that's the word, snitch, snitch. I, I was a snitch in school, I was a snitch, I'll tell you that right now. I, was, I, I didn't care, I was a snitch, I was a big snitch. <laughs> my, my nephew was laughing, he liked that. I, li I was a big snitch in school, and I didn't care. Because in my school bag, only time I used to be an outlaw was because I was a snitch. I had a pair of nunchucks in my school bags. I was ready. <laughs> I'd appear nunchucks, because I knew I was a snitch. Amen. Amen. I worked at a supermarket, co-worker steal, I snitch. One day a lady called the store. I'm going to get back to my story, the guy in the bus. Lady called the store. I answered, I was an office clerk at this time. And I, she asked for somebody, I said, hold on, I didn't put the phone on. You know, you press the side, the thing that says hold, and no, no, you can have a conversation, nobody hears you. But I didn't do that, I just left it. I just said, hold on, and I'm listening to her conversation. And I had a nickname back then, because I used to like Calypso. So my nickname was Soka. So the lady talking to somebody in the background next to her, and she said, that's Soka, he think he owns Preblo. <laughs> I was 19. I was 19. But I took what I did seriously. So Shane, she said, that's so okay. That's so okay. I think he owns Preblo. That's the supermarket. Are you hearing me? Because I stood for something. Back to the story of the bus man. Bus man found himself tooth missing, eyes half shut, bleeding. Went to the hospital. And he said, but God... I'm living for you, I'm going to seminary. Why did this happen to me? And he decided to press charges. He went to the hospital. The same policeman who walked off the bus who didn't arrest the guys was the same policeman he ran into at the hospital. And then he said, look what happened to me. 
and they rounded up about four of the guys and eventually found some other guys. Press charges got arrested. Case was taken to the court and he said he's in court and his lawyer. And day after day at the trial and one day he said, I'm gonna do something different. And he stood up and the lawyers are pulling at his tail, coat tail, I tell him, sit down, sit down. He said, Your Honor, I, I want to out of all the amount of time these guys are going to do in jail, and I'm going to serve their time in jail. So if he's going to get two years, if she's going to get three years, if he's going to get one year, uh, uh, three, five, seven, if there is seven years total, I'm going to serve their time in jail. Let them go free. The, um, the judge said, sit down, you're out of order. And he stood back up. He said, no, Your Honor. The, the judge said, it's never been done before. He said, yes, Your Honor. And he pulled out the Bible and he said, many years ago, 2,000 years ago, it was done. Jesus paid the price that I was supposed to pay. But the judge said, sit down. And they all went to jail, served time. But he was willing to forgive them. But what's my point? These guys served time because somewhere at home, they tried authority at home and got away tried it in the public. But I said, the law is merciless. Remember the young man said, Your Honor, I'm going to serve time for them. But the law says, no, you did the crime, you do the time. I close with this. I close with this. What verse did I tell you to go to? Exodus chapter 2. Verse 23, Exodus two. chapter 2, verse 23. Exodus chapter 2, hear what it says. Now it happened in the process of time that the king of Egypt died. Then the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage and they cried out. Remember, cried out? Yes. When things are hard, things are difficult, things are diff hard, uh, you, you're up to your neck in problems and difficulties, so you cry out to God. It, it, it's a, a deep emotional expression like, I'm in trouble, I'm desperate, I need help. So because of the bondage, they groaned and they cried out to the Lord, and the cry came up to God because of the bondage. So God heard the groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. And God looked upon the children of Israel, and God acknowledged them. They were in trouble. They were between a rock and a hard place. They were in a hard place. They cried to God. And what did God do? God heard them. God not only heard them, but Shanae, the Bible says God acknowledged their crying. They're crying out to him. Now, look at the next, um, uh, look at, um, go to, go to um, Psalms. Well, you know what? You go to Psalms 22, 24. Psalms 22, 24. Psalms 22, 24. So in Exodus, we see that they cried to God and God, God heard them, Right? Same, Jonah cried to God when he was in the fish's belly. Like I said to you, some people only cry to God, begin to pray when they are in trouble, when they are in jail, when they are in prison, when marriage fail, when the divorce is finalized and, uh, and they, they lose their car, they lose their home. Uh, anytime people find themselves when the back is against the wall, that's when they cry out to God. To God. Okay? Uh, my advice to you, do what's right. So you don't find yourself crying out to God as Jonah did when he was a little too late. Even the God will still hear us. Amen. Yes, class? Amen. God will still hear us. Psalms 22 and look at verse 24. For he has not despised, despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, nor has he hidden his face from him. But when he cried to him, he heard him. Are you hearing me? He says, he has not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. 
That means God is not overlooking the problems you're going through. He said, and he has not hidden his face from him. Now, I close with this illustration. Listen to this carefully. My little nephew David, when he was younger, he doesn't do it much anymore, but I haven't heard him doing it in a long time. But when he was younger, Tamika, and he's talking to me, and when he's talking to me, David had a thing like he liked to say, if he's talking to him, I'm not looking at him, he's going to stop and say, are you looking at me? Look at me, uncle, I'm talking. That's when he was younger. So I would have to look at him for him to continue saying what he's saying. Now, when he's speaking, when he was speaking back in those times, when he was younger, he liked to say also, uh, are you hearing me, uncle? And I'd have to say, yes. I'd like to acknowledge that he, he, he you know, I'm listening. Yes. So, David liked to look at me, uncle. Are you hearing me, uncle? Look what God says. He says, he has not hid his face. Right. <clears throat> So the same way David wants me to look at him in his face, God is looking at you when you cry to him, Tamika. He hasn't hid his face. He didn't, that means he didn't turn his back on you. If somebody hid their face, it means they turned their back. Like what parents like to say, I wash my hands from that old rebellious, no good for nothing child of mine. When a parent says they wash their hands, it means they have nothing to do with you. God said, no, I haven't turned my back. I know you're rebellious. I know you're disobedient, but I have not turned my back on you. Yes, class? Yes. Let's close this out. Look at verse 3. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your billows passed over me. Now, why was Jonah cast into the sea? It was God's way of judging him. This was now judgment on him. I want to be obedient to God because I don't want any judgment to come on me. You cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas. Let's stop. Tamika, God did not just cause the sea man to throw him anywhere, just anywhere overboard. It had to be the deepest part of the ocean where he can't stand, he can't swim his way back. The current is too strong. Oh, God. Look what he says. Look, look, look. He says, into the heart of the seas. And the flood surrounded me. And your billows and your waves passed over me. It was too much for me to handle. I'm going to use a phrase. We like to say it a lot. I've been through hell and back. Uh, let's say loud and strong. I've been. Amen. Loud and strong class. I've been to. I've been to. When, whenever you hear the phrase, I've been to hell and back, what does it mean? Did it, does it mean that you physically went to hell? Remember Jonah says, I cried out from Sheol, from hell. Did, was he really in hell? No, his experience was a hellish experience. When somebody says, I've been to hell and back, what are they saying? They, they have had a terrible experience. It was a terrible experience. terrible experience, very difficult, very unpleasant, or it was a painful experience. Jonah's hell and back was in the fish's belly. For somebody else, it was jail, it was prison, it was a divorce, it was a car repossession, it was a, uh, an eviction. That can be hell and back, meaning... You survived even though it was hard. You survived even though it was? It was hard. He said, I was cast into the sea. I, I, I have to show you this. Go to Psalms 42 and we close with this. Psalms 42. This is our last psalm. And then we uh, we'll shut it down. Psalms 42. Go to Psalms 42. Psalm 42, verse 5. You see all what Jonah just said? I was cast into the heart of the seas. The waves and the billows passed over me. It was too much for me to handle. 
It was beyond my control. I was helpless. I was hopeless. Now look at Psalms 42. Are you there? This is our last psalm, then I'm going to let you go home to have your, your steak and your roast beef and your whatever, okay? Uh, some of you cooking, you don't offer pasture, but that's all right. Yeah, being greedy and selfish. <laughs> <laughs> Psalms 42, read it loud and strong, verse 5. Why are you cast down on my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Why are you... Cast down, O oh my soul. Come here, Devin. Everybody say hi, Devin. <laughs> All right. Come on, Devin. Lay on the back on this table for me, Devin. Facing that way. Oh, facing that way. Oh, yeah. Oh, wait, wait, just stay there. I mean, just lay on your back. Let's lay on your back. Okay. Everybody can see Devin? Put your two legs up, Devin. The two legs up, open them a little bit, all right? Put your hands up also, just like that, just way up in the air, just like that. All right, this is what you call a cast position. This is what you call a cast position. Jonah found himself almost in a cast position as a sheep will oftentimes find himself or herself in a cast position. The psalmist says, he says, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? Talking about the position of a sheep. Keep your eyes on me. Come again. Talking about a sheep finding himself or herself in a cast position. Now, quickly, back in the Caribbean Islands, most people, most everybody on the island own animals. It's traditional. Okay? It's traditional. Everybody owns animals. You got a pig, you got a goat, you got a sheep, you got whatever. Everybody owns animal, dog, whatever. Now, oftentimes when I was a little boy and I would be going to the pasture or going around, I would see, always see a sheep. I would always find the sheep. Are you tired, Devin? Yep. All right. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's what I went to when I was in the military in the army. <laughs> now, you, I would always find a sheep. Relax, you're going to do this in a second. I would always find a sheep died somewhere, and I would always see the sheep on its back with its legs up, four of its legs up, right? And I didn't understand why every time I found a sheep dead, it's always on its back with four legs up. Do that again one more time, Levin. So this is a, a cast position. So David was saying, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? This means a sheep now is so dumb, not wise, not clever like a goat. Now a sheep will stumble and fall on their back, and the sheep will stay in that position and cry, meh, meh. <clears throat> if the shepherd doesn't come and roll the sheep over on his leg, Devin, on your leg, go, come on, roll over on your leg, right? <laughs> Go, go on your leg like four now. Go, go. If the shepherd doesn't find the sheep on time to roll the sheep over on his four legs, that sheep would stay in the cast position like this until it dies. That's why David says, thank you, Devin. Why are you cast down? It's called a... Cast position. A cast position is when the sheep finds itself helpless, hopeless, and not wise enough to just roll over off your back on your legs and stand up and carry on in life. Jonah found himself in the belly of the fish in a cast position, meaning he was helpless. He was not literally now on his back on all fours up, but he was in a place where he was helpless. And the only one can help Jonah when he was in a cast position was God himself to come, speak to the fish, and say to the fish, go and spit Jonah out, vomit Jonah out on the shores of Nineveh. Because if God does not release Jonah, he would die in the belly of the fish because there was no way out unless God himself rescued him. 
Sometimes in life, we find ourselves in many and various cast positions in life. People that are in jail, in prison, in a bad relationship, in a bad marriage, in a bad whatever, covenant, agreement, in gangs, whatever. We find ourselves in cast positions. And if God does not rescue those individuals, they will die in that position, in that cast position. It takes God because we are not intelligent enough. We are not wise enough to say all I've got to do is roll over, change position, change direction, change the course you're going, and watch God fix things up. A sheep is so stubborn, so foolish, that they would stay on their back and cry, man, 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 until there's no breath left and the sheep will die in the cast position. And only God can rescue a sheep in a cast position. Only God can rescue us when we find ourselves in cast positions in life and situations and experiences. And that's when we need to cry to him and say, God, come. And help me. That's why Jonah realized, I am in this cast position. I am helpless. I am hopeless. So I have no other alternative but to cry to him. And the Bible says God heard him. 